Hello and welcome to Zero Pucks Given, the UK ice hockey podcast. We are sponsored by the Hockey Art Co, hockey clothing for hockey people, worn by the best and hated by the rest. Listeners to Zero Pucks Given get a 10% discount on everything site-wide at hockeyartco.co.uk. Just use the code ZP10 upon checkout to get your discount. Right, welcome back for this bonus episode for this week. This is episode 58 Uh, And I've got a guest joining me in this episode to discuss all the news in the UK ice hockey world. But there has been some breaking news this morning in the NIHL 1 South, the Britain division. Oxford City Stars have departed with their head coach, Simon Anderson. Uh, I'll read you the, uh, the release in full. It is with a heavy heart that Oxford City Stars announced the departure of head coach Simon Anderson through mutual consent. Simon has been an integral part of our club, contributing significantly to our journey, and it is with sincere appreciation that we bid him farewell. Regrettably, the current season has not unfolded as envisioned, and despite Simon's unwavering dedication, the desired results on the ice have been elusive. The dressing room, for various reasons, has not responded to Simon's strategies as anticipated, leading to this difficult but mutual decision. Simon leaves with our utmost respect, gratitude and best wishes for his future endeavours. His contributions to the team will be remembered and we thank him for his tireless efforts. In the interim, Shannon Taylor, a familiar face within the Oxford City Stars family, will step into the role of caretaker coach. Shannon brings valuable experience and a deep understanding of our team dynamics. We want to express our gratitude to Simon for his dedication and hard work during his time with the City Stars. It's always a tough decision when parting ways with someone who has given so much to the club, said Shane Moore, head of hockey operations for Oxford City Stars. Looking ahead, Oxford City Stars is actively exploring options for a new head coach that match our growth plans and ambitions. We invite applications from experienced players and head coaches who may be interested in taking on this pivotal role within our organisation. So Oxford City Stars on the look for a new coach. Unfortunate, obviously, as they say, Simon's been a massive part of that club. But the uh, with what was, I'm not even sure financially what was invested, but with the changes that were made this year in the roster, I know they got everyone excited, including myself, and the results on the ice just haven't seemed to follow, uh, especially following with the off-ice stuff, which seems to be going very well at Oxford. So it's not mirroring each other. So. We, we bid a farewell to Simon as well. Simon was always a massive, massive contributor to Zero Pucks Given with his coach's thoughts. So we also wish him uh, all the best for the future. Right, let's get to our guest then. We are discussing all the ins and outs of the UK ice hockey world. He normally discusses it on Twitter, but we're going to be hearing his voice today. He's a, a former Paisley Pirate, a former Slough Harrier, a former Streatham hockey player. Now a commentator, he was one of the original parts of the 4000 and Counting podcast as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Jamie McElroy. Zero Pucks Given in partnership with the Hockey Art Co. We are about to send UK Hockey Twitter slash X into Meltdown. Um, it's the return of the Mac. I'm joined by Jamie McElroy. How are you doing, fella? Good, Ben. Really good. Uh, I'm going to be rusty at this, mate, to be honest with you. I've never been at the other side of the mic. It's easy just throwing questions at people. We were doing it on 4,000, but um, I've never been this side of it, and I've not been on a microphone for ages. I just use the medium of social media to cause outrage, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you slip into it actually. I mean, when when Nicky came on with me, he said similar that it was like the only time he'd been on the other side of it was when he spoke with uh, Anthony Russell from Banners on the Wall regarding yeah. his drug ban. So um, yeah, he, he he said he think he quite enjoyed it in the end actually being on the other side. Yeah, it's just strange. Uh, man. So 
Well, for starters, mate, for anyone who's who's not in the world of Twitter, where did, where did your hockey sort of experience start and where did it take you? I said this a bit watery. I says we're going to keep this limited because it is a short, short career. I uh, <laughs> I grew up in I grew up in Paisley, basically a, a impoverished housing scheme as we call them, uh, called Sea Till and Paisley. And basically, they built the Lagoon Ice Rink. I don't know if you know that's where the Pirates played years ago. I don't know how long you've been following yeah. hockey. Basically, the Zamp- I've done my research. Yeah, well, the, the Zamboni pit basically looked on to the back of the the tenement flats where I lived. So we used to go along skating, chasing skirt, I suppose. Uh, managed to do a bit of skating. Went along and watched my first ice hockey game with the Pirates. And then I became kind of hooked, like enjoying watching it. Um, and then they were starting beginner session because it was also new in Paisley about getting kids to play hockey. And I started around 12 years old. Um, and then went through the sort of junior system at Paisley. Played for Scotland juniors and then got to about the age of 17 and then your interests start going elsewhere <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe it was a bit of interest for the sport I was getting limited time moving up into under 21s and beyond and stuff just sort of fell out of love with it um, and stepped away for like seven years until uh, I joined the RAF um, and they had a rec hockey team then so somebody kind of got me back into it one of my mates in the RAF that was, was coaching the team um, and I started enjoying it. And then when I moved down from Scotland and got down to England, I thought, I was watching like teams, you know, like the e 2 teams, it was any e 1 and I thought, I could offer something to these teams. I, I could actually play that league and give it a bash. So I trialled for a few, trialled for Oxford. Uh, and then I found Slough Harrier Hawks who were on their arse, they were e 2 and Brian Biddulph, Mason's dad, was actually coaching them. Got my senior debut at 27 years old. <laughs> Um, yeah. And then the Harrier Hawks folded. But even in that team then, we had like uh, Dan Rose that plays for the Bees, Timo Lindgren that plays for the Jets, he was playing for them. Uh, who else? Evander Grinnell Park that played for Romford, the Raiders at the time in EPL, and then the NIHL won. Um, we had a little band then. And then when Greener came in and Zoran took over the Jets, they went e one one uh, And I managed to get a place in the team and then captain the team. That led on to running about the leagues for a couple of years and just banging as many bodies as I can and kind of get noticed by Barry Spowers at Streatham. Um, and I was going to stop playing because I get deployed that summer. And he messaged me in the summer. He would try to get me to go down to Streatham uh, the year before. But I wanted to stay with Slow because I was a captain. There was a bit of loyalty to it. Uh, and Barry says, I, I think you'd be good in this team. I want you to come over. So... I spent my two t- two years in Streatham there and I absolutely loved it. And everything kind of let my avenue into hockey and everybody that I, I knew sort of came from those two years and just sort of progressed. We're retiring. I still want to be involved in hockey, but it's just like you probably found out where where does your avenue take you and what do you want to do and how do you want to try and influence and better in the game? And that's, that's kind of my impetus now. Yeah, it was... I- were you still playing? Because you you were involved in the the origins, really, of four thousand and counting. Um, yeah, yeah. Were you still the, playing was there from the back. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, my job that took me over to I was on a NATO posting in Belgium for three years. So I retired. I retired from Streatham. I think it was thirteen, fourteen, and then I moved over there twenty sixteen, and I thought. I've been out. I hadn't even skated for two years, but I saw this team in Valenciennes. It was like ten minutes from the house. I knew I was going to get a lot of free time. Chance to play in Europe, which a player of my calibre shouldn't even get an opportunity to do. But I thought, I'll go along there. Do what I always did. I run about like a headless chicken in a few trial games, bang some bodies and see what happens. And um, they took me on and we did a year in D3 and then two years in D2. They kept me on for three years. And during that time, it came about that uh, what I and me and Bandy and Alan Armour actually in the very beginning had a chat about starting the podcast um, and in the end it just sort of was like me, Watty and Bandy because of uh, Arm's work commitments but it was born about the middle of my tour there so uh, probably middle of 2017 it all started, 2018 yeah so I was still yeah. in Belgium and I was still I was still playing when it started yeah because no, that was um I mean, I think it was probably the first of its kind, really, to be a player podcast where it was 
all run by players, talking to players, you know, stories from the room and from the road. And it was, um, and the fact it's still going now and doing as well as it's doing is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, there's no, there's no hiding from the fact that when we started it, we took our sort of motivation and our modus operandi from listening to chicklets. That, that's the way it was. That, that was ex-players doing it. It was the way that we did. And we just thought, there's nothing in the UK that kind of does that. And what in those boys from the EPL, I know lads, Bandy knows lads. And even if we didn't know lads, we, we kind of knew, no matter, you could be interviewing somebody from NHL 1 to the EPL to the Elite League to ex NHLers. But when you talk to somebody as like a hockey person, regardless of the level you play that, it's a different conversation I think you can have. And I think that's why it sort of it took off. Pretty quickly, and the, the growth yeah. was exponential. It, it got it got quite big quite quickly. Yeah, that's something. Obviously, I've got a slightly different point of view, having never played the game. I, I just sort of coming from a from a fan point of view. I think that's good as well, but though, because a... I think obviously there's there is the four thousand and count thing which comes from the player side of it, but there's questions and stuff that you'd want to talk about that I'd probably not even think about. So I think the more podcasts that are out there, and as long as they're well received and they've done well and they're they're well researched at the part. I mean, we never research. We just do stuff off the cuff. Most of the time, we're pissed just firing questions at people. Um, and some of them have ended up being <laughs> a shit show. But I think the more people that are out there putting content out, I mean, there's an appetite for it, isn't there? You've seen the, the lessons that you get. Yeah, yeah. And it's and there's there's quite a few out there now. Obviously, obviously, myself, I've been going sort of just over a year. I've got the boys at three on three doing a cracking job in the elite league. Yeah, I've listened to um, them, yeah. The, my, uh, Michael at Pucking Mad, obviously Anthony Russell has been doing banners on the wall for for donkeys years, and that's why I started Zero Pucks was because I was I've been following the Chieftains for a little while, and then I kind of thought I can't find anything, you know, online that's talking about this level. Yeah. So it's um yeah, getting it out there's more. I think it's it's kind of we're not taking responsibility for growing the sport, but we're certainly doing our part. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I know this is a, a sort of chief chieftains based. I know that you sort of interview and bring different subjects in from around British hockey. But when I retired from Streatham, actually, it was at Riverside that I retired. Um, that was it. And yeah, yeah. And I've got a lot of time. I mean, the abuse I used to take at Riverside, which I gave back. You know, a lot of the the existing chieftains fans will tell you they, they probably remember they used to heckle me. Yeah, I give it back, but it was all in good banter. But on that um, night I retired, it straight on at the end of the season. Now, I was emotional, I'm not even going to lie. Um, I was almost crying off the night, the, the ice, and I was deploying to Afghanistan uh, two weeks later. And all of the Chieftains fans, like, you know, when you come off the ice towards the, the changing rooms, they all stayed. Yeah. I got a guard of honour off the boys. All the Chieftains fans applauded me off. A couple of them shook my hands and wished me well. And that's something that stuck with me. I mean, that... I think every fan base has got an, an idiot element to it, and, and some more than others. Um, but I, I was grateful for the way that the sort of Chieftain fans gave me sort of like a moment of respect and this little lower level of hockey and, and sort of gave me kudos and that uh, always sticks with me. Yeah, I mean, you say there about the about the fan bases, it's, I mean, I've one of my enjoyments of it generally is it's not football. You know, you don't have that kind of thuggery or or hooligan element to ice hockey. Well, I have for the most part. Yeah, for the most part. But it's the problem is now as well. I mean, where where your your strongest arena now online is that people have become far too comfortable with anonymous anonymously saying shit, and not as Tyson says, not taking a smack in the mouth for it. And and one, I'd say one of the things I do love about you is one of the, when I started following you is that not only do you give it back, it doesn't come from a place of of anger or abuse. It comes from a place of knowledge, and any argument that anyone's got online, and if they dig at you or they dig at someone, when you come back, it's coming back with hard facts and proper knowledge of the game. Yeah, and, and I'm, it's very enjoyable. I, oh, thanks. I yeah. Uh... <laughs> I mean, there's maybe there's maybe a misconception and a preconception of me that I'm just a gobshite that doesn't actually have a clue about anything. I like to think that I've got a modicum of knowledge about hockey, but I, I know people have a bit of emotional intelligence as well. And if I if somebody goes at somebody and I think it's wrong and I'll question it, I don't give a shit if they come back at me. I don't give a shit if they get personal. I'm happy to debunk theories and I'm happy to put my point across, but I'm also happy to listen to people. I've had people come to me before and say, 
it's your way or no way. You don't listen to anybody. That, that's not true at all. I mean, I, I'm more more than willing and happy to get involved and engage in any sort of debate and to and fro. But at the end of the day, I'll, I'll, I'll be saying stuff based on facts and stuff that I've I genuinely thought about. I'm not just sat like one of these keyboard warriors with a picture of a, a penguin as a profile picture and loads of numbers at the end just shouting abuse at people. It, mm. it does come from a place where I think that it elicits discussion with other people um, and it's done wholeheartedly by showing viewpoints that loads of people have got and not to cause a pile on but maybe open people's eyes to some of the, the short-sighted views that some people's got in British hockey and the way that they go about their business. Yeah, and that, I mean, they don't really go much more short-sighted than some of the organisations that are running the game. And there's been, obviously, in the last few weeks, there's been a, I don't know whether to say, a, it's a, obviously after the tragedy of Adam Johnson and then Planet Ice not covering themselves in glory, the EIHA not in particularly covering themselves in glory, and then the Elite League decided not to, to mandate the net guards like all the other uh, organizations are done. Um, I mean, we'll start with Planet Ice. I think <laughs> most Basic Stoke fans will probably, being honest with themselves, know, as you've alluded to in the last couple of days, they're not coming back next year. No, they're um, not. And, um, the, state, the state of that rink. Do you know, do you know what the sad thing is, Ben? I mean, like I, uh, like I was saying when I played juniors, played Scotland, but then, you know, you get conference weekend now. What it used to be years ago, obviously I'm going by decades because I'm a fucking dinosaur, but conference weekend used to be held at Basingstoke when it started. So Scotland used to send down a Western Scotland team and an Easter Scotland team. So I went down with a Western Scotland team when it was held at Basingstoke. And what his mum and dad were there watching it, they told me when I've, I've said this before, now I went down to that facility and I thought it was brilliant. Like we had good access to changing room, the ice was fantastic. Um, and the facility was in a good place. It, and I've the next time that I went back to it was when we were playing, you know, two against the Buffalo. It was terrible then. I went back for the charity game that we had last year or the year before. And the place was just disgusting. And it's been it's been run into a hole. And when they announced last year that the Bison weren't going to be icing this year, I said at the time, they will definitely not be back next year. And in my honest opinion, I think the Bison are going to be confined to the doldrums of British history books. I, I, as, as much as I don't want that to happen, so many good people around Basingstoke, so many people that care so much about hockey and a passionate fan base and loads of lads that have loved playing there and if it's success at all levels. Um, but it's where heavy heart saying that. I, it's only my personal opinion. It's not what I've been told. But I, I, I yeah. think it might be the end of the Bison. Yeah, I mean, the Buffalo are still playing there. They are, which yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that's obviously lower amount of people coming in to watch yeah, from and what, whatnot. But that still doesn't change the quality of the surface and the facility. No, it doesn't. From what I've been told, it is. It's that capacity element because years gone by, the Bison have had good attendances, good fan base, um, and, and they can't house them in the arena. We'll put in inverted quotes anymore because of the limited capacity. Um, but even those boys, they, they, in the, the juniors and the, the women, they, there's, there's nobody that should be playing on ice like that. There's nobody that should be playing out a facility that's as badly run and aptly run as that. And it's it's literally without even exaggerating that the place is falling around, falling down around them. Yeah, I mean, for those of us joining on YouTube, you'll be able to see. I'll put up now this picture from Basingstoke. I think it was from this weekend, where um, I mean, it looks like a car park in January when it's frozen over and you can you know, almost see the black tarmac through it. And it's it's quite poor to consider that they're letting, like the, the although it's Planet Ice run, Planet Ice are involved with the NIHL sponsoring the National League. They have want to kind of be the guardians of this pathway that they're going to let teams link with the Elite League and whatnot. You can't let your member clubs, players, play on surfaces like that. No, you can't. And it... And, the, the the big thing is as well is that Leeds have got this shiny new rink that Planet Ice have, have obviously run. You look at Peterborough and you look at Peterborough fans and the issues they've had with their facility over the years and how badly run that is. They're complaining about it constantly. And even now people are trying are saying that there's stuff that needs done doing the Leeds and that being one of the newer arenas that they mm. that 
they're in control of. So it doesn't bode well in the long term. I, I think it, if Basingstoke go and Peterborough gets worse and so on and so on, where where does it end before they put their hand in the pocket yeah. and start investing properly in the facilities that they actually are there for? Even Bristol, another one of the sort of newer ones. Yeah, has, sorry, has I forgot about Bristol. Issues. So that there, and and obviously not just the Basingstoke thing. There was also obviously a bit of bad press after the Adam Johnson tragedy, where their statement was a slight, slightly bit confusing. Uh, there were also, I think we can use the word guilty of virtually poisoning people a couple of a couple of weeks ago up in Widness. Yeah, the, the big thing for that with me, Ben, was the fact that there's, I mean, you, you've probably seen all the stuff in 4,000 that we put out in the very beginning when we were calling. We were calling out EIHA, EIHA but we are calling them out because it was things that, that needed rectified. And what we've always asked for is transparency, clarity, and honesty. And that's all anybody yeah. wants, no matter what business they work on or where they operate. Um, and what they should have done straight away, especially because of the gravity of the, the, the situation that it was carbon monoxide poisoning. They should have been up front straight away, got ahead of the game and said, this is what it is. If you're feeling any of these ill effects, please go to the hospital. What, what somebody in that ice ring that was watching the Wild game or was watching a juniors game earlier on that day, what if they were pregnant? I mean, the repercussions are huge and it opens up all sorts of legality, legal proceedings that could be brought against them. So in any facet, in any industry in life, you should be honest. And I, I, I don't think they have. I mean, they've only just came out and said that it was to do with carbon monoxide over the past couple of days. And they've said it's to do with the Zamboni. And I mean, I, I'm not I'm not saying that it wasn't the Zamboni. Let me put it like that. But if you Google carbon monoxide poisoning in ice facilities, the first thing that comes up over a case study in North America is because of Zambonis. That 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 could be it. Could it be something else? And they're saying it's a Zamboni and they've rectified that without anybody knowing. I don't know. I mean, you've got to take them at word and that it was the Zamboni. But I think for so many to, people to be feeling the ill effects of carbon monoxide poisoning afterwards and that nobody else had done it, nobody else had had cases of that from witness previously, you would think was was the Zamboni sitting for seven hours just pumping out these gases to cause that to happen. I mean, yeah. a couple of ice cuts for that many people to go downhill with it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, obviously... I think it was at a wild game, so there'd probably been junior games, maybe even a women's game. It was junior games earlier in the day. day. Yeah, yeah, possibly public skate as well. So it would have been cut a few times. Um, I, I did speak to one of the wild players who, who wants to remain anonymous, and and he'd said it was the worst game he'd ever played. He, he couldn't think, he couldn't breathe, and a, a couple of the lads had to go to hospital. And it's yeah, absolutely shocking. Yeah, and it's and that's the thing. It's like. I don't. I, nobody. Nobody could have. Nobody could have held them to account or said that they'd done anything wrong because that in itself, if it's coming from a zamboni, is something that yes, it should be regularly service maintained and checked for these sort of things. But that could have went unnoticed. But mm. the gravity of the situation and what could have happened afterwards, the fact that it took them what well over a week to actually come out and say, even though everybody else knew, because we put it out in, in different outlets and social medias and people talking to us and stuff like that. Um, and people had seen gas engineers outside the ring. So everybody knew, but, but they weren't doing it. And that's that's what done no. sit right with me. And like you say, it's the honesty and the clarity that you want from them. It's because no one's saying they're doing this stuff on purpose. No, 100%. But, but, they're, but they're not doing enough to, you know, to, to stop these things from happening. Yeah. And, and it's just a, it's an easy target as well because if we're saying that they're not maintaining the facilities right, which they're not doing in Basingstoke, which they're not doing in Peterborough, if you look at that thing with the Zamboni, if that's where the carbon monoxide leaks come from, they're obviously not maintaining the ice resurfacing machine either because you would do daily checks on that, wouldn't you? You would have a detector yeah. to check if the levels were high. Uh, you would be checking if the exhaust fumes... You go in an MOT, they check your levels, don't you? to see if they're, they're over a, a safe level um, when you get it tested there. So you would think that these regular checks would have been getting carried out, but if they're not doing it for the mm. whole rink facilities, are they doing it for the, the equipment that you use within it as well? Yeah, and you'd like to think that the actual rink itself had carbon monoxide alarms. Well, surely so if it's a commercial property... A... Yeah, if it's a commercial property, you've got a footfall through the door. Surely they've got public public liability insurance and uh, stuff within that, that that says that they need to have these sort of precautions 
Finlay. Yeah, which yeah, but which is obviously sort of some something's gonna miss somewhere, isn't it? And they've I think they've got a lot of making up to do with um with the hockey community in this country. It's never ending. If it's not a facility, it's carbon monoxide poisoning, it's trying to block a takeover bit of a national team to further their own gains. It's it, mm. it's just been from obviously all of these things with the rinks in the background, that's been going on years. But I think ever since the sort of summertime, it's all sort of come to a forefront. But I don't think they can get ahead of it because there seems to be something new every other month that comes out of a yeah. Planet Ice Arena. Yeah, and they're like, oh, it's like they're um, they're, they're trying to put out a forest fire with a pint pint glass, and every yeah, time they go yeah. there, something goes off somewhere else, and yeah, they're and I bet they, chasing I bet their they tails now. I bet they feel to themselves that they can't get a break, but if if you're doing your job correctly and you're you're operating your business in the correct manner, then you, you wouldn't have these sort of things happening to you. Uh, and and the. The English Ice Hockey Association as a whole, I mean, I'm not entirely sure of any <laughs> connection they may have with Planet Ice and whatnot, but obviously they're now searching for a new chair. Um, obviously, the, the boys at 4000 and Anthony at Banners and the Wall have discussed it, and it seems the the outline and the eligibility criteria they have has made it virtually impossible for a former player or a former coach to actually get involved. It won't be a former player and it won't be a former coach. I know that for a fact. Um hmm. It's it, the fact that they're saying that it's somebody that has got no affiliation in any term to any team at any level. Is that correct? Is that and I'm paraphrasing here? Yeah, but that's pretty yeah. much it. Um, listen, I, yeah. I, and, and, at, and no one who's undertaken any paid work for for a club. No, and I mean I'm looking at Ice Hockey UK, uh, and I know they've done a lot of things where they've they're bringing in people with a business mindset and people that have got sporting background, maybe not within our arena. And that seems to be working for them. They're, they're doing it well. And I don't know if they actually are trying to follow that blueprint or what I think it is. I think they're trying to keep people away that do have a hockey background that may well come in and have a look at things and say, this is what hockey players at all levels have been looking to restructure the organisation. These are the things that they want to happen. And this is how we're going to go about it. I think the EIHA for too many years has been an old, boy, old boys club. It's been jobs for the boys and it's been looking after each other. Um, and I think it needs a, a massive shake-up from top to bottom. I've been a, a massive proponent and advocate for that for a long, long time. Um, and again, there's may, maybe maybe off at the back of the stuff, a 4,000 and stuff, this, this stuff that I've put out. I don't think anything that I've put out or 4,000 have put out uh, when I was with them is anything that people didn't know. It's just that we've given it an outlet in a wider audience and this sort of stuff's been going on for years it, it's nothing new it's just the fact that it's been highlighted even put out in the public domain now and more people are aware of it yeah and, and obviously with social media being what it is it it doesn't take long for this stuff to sort of get around everywhere no no it doesn't and i mean and they're like, but... You've got to take everything in social media with a pinch of salt. I do. I mean, I don't take anything seriously that I read or anything that anybody says to me, but there's a lot of stuff out there that, that does need to be known, the stuff that goes out that maybe a casual observer, maybe maybe a fan of a team does not get a clue about what's happening in the background that may well affect their team, that may well affect their kids when they're juniors, that may well affect their rec team in the long run, the way that the IHA is run. And... And that's been the biggest thing with the IHA as well. That there is no clarity. There's nobody willing to put their name to one issue and explain why they've done something. And that's the most frustrating yeah. thing. That's where you're banging your head against the wall, whether you're a player, whether you're a manager, whether you're a coach, whether you're a fan. You want some sort of reasoning uh, about why you're making the decisions that you're making. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I said in the last episode with regards to the Department of Player Safety, is there's no clarity on what tier is what, what constitutes the movement between the tiers. There's, it's it's a shambles. Yeah, a shambles is putting it softly, in my but if I'm, if well, I'm and, and that's the that. one thing that someone put their someone put their name to that. To start with, with, with the the Darcy Flanagan issue, which is kind of what kind of kicked it all off. Someone put their name to that, and and he's no longer there. 
Yeah, but from what I'm led to believe of Mike Maidens, yes, he fair play to him. I mean, what what I always said was the discipline committee committee were this anonymous entity that you sent an email to when you did appeal. Nobody responded with anything in an email. Nobody knew who was making decisions. And Mike Maidens over the summer put his name to that. He gave a presentation to the officials about how it was going to run. Um, I think the tier system should have been scrapped because it's not fit for purpose. The DOPS isn't fit for purpose just now. Uh, and I've heard rumours that people are saying that ex-players don't want to get involved because of the abuse that they'll get. I don't want to mm. head up DOPS. I'll put that up first and foremost. But if I did, what I would say is I, I would I would pin my flag to the mast and put my name out there and say, this is a decision that I made. This is the reason that I made it. And when it comes to an appeal, then you can come back with a rebuttal to say, because you made that decision, you've made it wrong, we think this. Just now it's not. The tier system's not fit for purpose. The, the way that they jump up, nobody knows who's going to get a ban. And then the whole appeals process um, and the way that there's, there's no consistency in similar events about the punishments that get handed out. There's, there's teams that the players sat out for six games and then somebody does something similar and it's only one game. I mean, we look at Jack Brammer. Jack Brammer's game that he sat out, that's exactly how that should have been called. 100%. Mm. There's an infident, incident with uh, Jake Price at MK that was exactly the same. He got six games, I think. He should have sat that game. I said it at the time. I'm not just sticking up for Jack Brammer because I live near Sheffield and I know him. That was the right ban for him. Sits out one game. I wouldn't have kicked him out personally, but that's just my outlook. But if he sits a game, then fine. Price should have done the same. It might have been Luke Price. Pardon me. Um, and then there was a whole Darcy Flanagan thing. That, that should have been the same. That should have just been one game. And the, the way that they're looking at it isn't through the eyes of somebody who's played or somebody who's officiated at a decent level and had respect to the players. And that's where they're falling down. And that's where everybody's getting frustrated with it. And it, again, from the old overarching rehaul, that you, I would say that we need to the EIHA first and foremost. The DOPS it is an urgent thing that needs to look at. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and as we've said here, and I've, I've said on previous episodes, it's the inconsistencies in it that are becoming frustrating and it's and it's made i think it's made a lot of fans then wonder what what's going to happen because we we had an incident at jump sort of couple of, couple of weeks back with uh with cam bartlett where he's um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute if you want yeah so you know he, he got four games for fighting an un, uh, unwilling opponent which in the way that they do it is is the foot is a four game ban so it's a four game ban I don't think any of us were saying, oh, he should get 10 or he should get eight, he should get 12. But it was, look what they gave Darcy Flanagan. They gave him 10 for virtually nothing. Yeah. So what are they going to give for this? Yeah, and exactly. As I said, like when it came see. out, as a fan, I'll take four because after four games, then he's back. And, you know, I, th I think JJ missed two games with a concussion but uh, after the incident before he came back. But, yeah, it was... um. I, I mean, I, I never put my flag to the Masters how many games it should be. I just considering some of the decisions they've made, I was expecting it to be a lot longer than it was. And I was as well. And I mean, I've spoke to Cam about this because I, I, I was obviously sort of vocal in the fact that the way that it was. I mean, I played against Cam and Grant when they came into the league. Came in as like 18, 19, 20 year olds. Um, and I think he was a bit pissed off at the fact that I was making a big thing about it, but it was dirty. It was wrong. And I said to him, you, you can't go around doing that sort of stuff. Like, if if you were involved in a tussle and you punch somebody, you go punch or not punch, just fill them in, then fine. But JJ Pitchley, with his face turned away, Lionel had a hold of Cam, and Cam snuck an uppercut while he turned away, while he wasn't expecting it. And, and that's filth, that is. And I, like I say, I've said it to Cam and I'll say it again. It, it was wrong. Four games, was that right? Well, if you compare it to something like Darcy Flanagan, then no, it's not right. But I'm also saying that Darcy Flanagan's ban was no way right. So where do we find this middle yeah. ground? Where do we say four games? Yeah, can I eat that and move on? Um, obviously, you were involved in something as, as recent as last night with Brad Watch on, which I, I sort of spoke about yeah. as well at the Riverside. Um, Brad will eat a ban for that, and he should. Was it cheap? 100% it was cheap. But what you've got to understand about Brad, if you, you're not familiar with him, I think most people are, is that, that that's the game that he's played. He can play hockey. He's a fucking good hockey player, you know, and he played in the EPL and he's fought some of the toughest guys out there, but Brad's been brought in to do that job if it gets physical. And I think it was Harry mm. Hatfield that your, your Chelmsford lad was going to go with, and I think Harry would have yeah. done all right in that till. He's an army lad. He's pretty jacked, actually. Um, 
but that, that, that's in Brad's psyche. He's come off of there. First and foremost, I wasn't sucker punch. Brad Watchorn came off the bench, hit the kid. He saw him coming, but he went down. And if you know it's Brad Watchorn in front of you, he'd already committed to going with Harry Hatfield. He dropped his gloves. He was ready to go. He was going to dance and go to centre house and do all the shimmying and whatever else everybody likes to do for their attention. But then when he saw it was Brad that came in and started letting fly with the punches, he didn't want to fight no more. So my personal opinion, you can't be a spot picker. If you want to fight and the guy that's there to do it and the stars roster that's going to step up and fight you, you dance. If you come off us, you come off us. So it's not in, in effect of what they worded cams as. It's not fighting an unwilling opponent because it's the opponent punch. was willing to start with. Yeah, exactly. He was willing yeah. to go with somebody. He just wasn't willing to go with Bradders. That, that's what it comes down mm. to at the end. And it, it, they are on, the, on the consistency. <laughs> yeah. <I'm not> <laughs> on the consistency, but... should we see the same length of band then for Brad? It's four games. I don't think so. I wouldn't call it as that. If you're, if you're saying to me that Cam Bartlett ate four games for uh, sneakily sucker punching and uppercutting somebody in a clinch when they had no idea that the punch was coming, and then you compare that to somebody that's dropped the gloves, willing to go, but then didn't fancy it when somebody bigger and tougher came in. Bradley a ban because he got a game and that'll get reviewed 100% he will because he kept feeding them uh, when he was when he was reluctant to go. He never threw anything back, even though he dropped his gloves. If it was me, if, you, if again, if you're comparing it with Cam, Brad will sit too, but roll the dice. Who knows? <laughs> well, we've, I mean, we've seen other ones as well with, um, even up in the National, I think there was a, a stick to the head and there was a, a few others that kind of, same sort of incident, as you say, one got two games, one got six. Um, we've had Christian Moore sit for six for a, a hit from behind into the boards. That, from what I'm told, they put no video out of it. From what I've I'm told, people that. in the rink was a, now. From what I was told, it was a stumble. He sort of stumbled into the player rather than forcibly boarded it, uh, boarding him. Uh, and Kieran Rayner, who who will also be back this weekend with Cam, um, was given a six game for a hit to the head, which I saw on the live stream was a, a sort of a clash of hips. But it's um again they put no video feed out with explanation. The only one they did that with was Darcy Flanagan, and since it's been overturned, they've uh, and this is the, probably quite, quite rightly not doing that. And this is the thing. This is what it was. Um, this is what it was advertised in the off season that Mike Maidens had advertised it as. And I understand the resources that they may or may not have at hand, and the time that they may or may not have at hand. But it was packaged up to be similar to what the Elite League do, the fact that they, they show the video clip from where it was leading up to, what the incident was, what happened afterwards, and then any further incidents that fell off the back of that to determine the banter, the, the length of ban. And it's not been that. The only ones that they put out videos for are the ones that I feel are stuck out before they've announced the bans to highlight what's coming. And then they feel that they need to put one together and then explain the piece or, or back down and say, oh, we're going to come down a bit, which they've done a couple of things, did it with Vlad's Volkanovs. Um, but it's the ones that gain traction and the ones that people highlight to everybody that's watching, maybe on Twitter, on Facebook, on anything that are interested in what's going on. That's the only ones that they put videos out for. And if, if you want somebody to, if you want all the fans and the players and the coaches to get on board and embrace this system, then it's boring that I keep repeating it. It's clarity, it's honesty, it's consistency. And that's mm. something that we're not getting. And while you're not getting that, nobody trusts in the process and nobody's on board with it. We all want it scrapped and we all want a total restructure of how it works. We do, we do indeed. On to something slightly more positive, uh, you got into commentary as well. Oh, yeah. that's okay. How did yeah. you find your way into that? Was that through, through the, doing the, the <laughs> podcast? Well... So, uh, when we were still with 4,000, uh, we actually get invited along with the Steel Dogs because obviously pals with Ali Cree and always had a good sort of uh, relationship with the Steel Dogs and obviously I live around here and go down to the games and just a bunch of beauties, a lot of them, just such good hockey people up here in Sheffield. Um, but when we went down, we did a sort of bit of a pre-match interview uh with Roger and their team for Steel Dogs TV where the three of us spoke about how it was going to go and then at the start of the game in each in sorry each intermission and then at the end of the game 
um, we all sort of took a uh, one of those intermissions to say a piece about how it's going to go on the headset on the stream. Uh, I did my bit, which I thought went all right, even though I was like a bottle of buck fast and about ten bottles of bud deep. Um, <laughs> and then sort of from there, I got obviously you get you get Jonathan Fellney and Roger that do it up there, and Jonathan Fellney is obviously predominantly with the Steelers. Um, and when he's not there, Roger needs somebody else, so he kind of drafted me in for a couple of games. Kind of found my feet doing it, and then I was a regular whenever Jonathan went there. Um, and he was with the Steelers, and I loved it. I really, I got all well with it, and I got some good feedback from like away fans that listened to it, and and people that heard bits and bobs. And um, I'm obviously relatively still new to it, but it's something I've really enjoyed. And that's what I said to you at the sort of start of this was kind of finding your way in hockey and how you can stay involved and what you enjoy doing. And it's definitely something that I hope I'll pursue because now I've managed to, um, I've got onto the Steelers comms with. Uh, Jonathan over at the arena as well so that's that's something I'm going to sort of try and double hat next season when I get back from the deployment yeah and also the um the women's playoff finals I believe you commentated on I did and that that was off of um it was Faye Andrews you know Faye don't you yeah Faye's been on yeah she's fantastic and does so much for the women's game and for, for me that was something that I hadn't had a chance to go along or, or actually went out of my way to watch the women's game, especially the, the elite finals. And Faye messaged me asking me if I'd be willing to do it. I said 100%. If it, it shines more of a light in the women's game and what they're trying to achieve and publicise it and get it out there and, and hopefully make it a sort of professional production and the way that they commentate on it and gain a bigger foothold and visibility for it, I'm all for it. And going along and watching those women in those elite finals, there's some unbelievable players there and Abby Sylvester was one that jumped out at me straight away. She was one yeah. that I thought was absolutely phenomenal. I know she played for the Warriors and there's a couple of the women there that sort of play NIHL and I played against Angela Taylor when I played at Slough as well. And I've seen all of these the talent that's out there, but seeing it firsthand and the way that they play, that, that was a great experience as well. I really enjoyed that. And if Faye will have me, I don't know if she, she wants me back, but it's definitely something that I'd go back to because it, it was, it was an, another another look at what's going on and the more that you sort of look at all the different disciplines of hockey I think is excellent I've stood at the side of the rink watching the Steel Kings with the, the kids as well the para hockey which is mind blowing to me how, how they can do that as well and yeah I, I, I just think there's so much good to be got from publicising all of the hockey not just the way the EIHA are just now just putting snapshots off the Kieran Brown scoring 75,000 goals every season and his video reel. They should be publicising everything that's going on within their umbrella rather than just looking at the National League, no matter, even though it is a fantastic league that I've got a lot of support for. Yeah, Faye did mention to me that you she, she would absolutely be having you back on comms in May for the finals. Um, hopefully I should be up there as well to, to, to cover it for zero pucks given. Oh, you're going to get on uh, it. You're going to get on it. I'm going to bring some buck class for you. <laughs> yeah, I've no, I've never done Bucky. I've uh, even with a few Scottish friends I've had. I've, I've you never are actually in done it, but, I'm, time. but I had seven years of being teetotal, so I'm I can't drink now. I'm useless. Yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> but the um, I mean the EIHA's social media, as you say, just putting out the posts that they do. I actually I've gone scrolling back through because the the women's season started in mid September. And they've shared, I think it was a post from the Chelmsford Cobras and Pythons because they themselves made a promo video and they've shared something else from one of the other clubs because they themselves made a promo video. They share absolutely nothing about all of those leagues in their umbrella. And that's that, that's disheartening for the young girls and the women that play in that league, whether it be from the lower tiers all the way up to the elite league. I mean, I don't know have you have you had a chance to watch the sort of the elite women's games? Not the elite, no. I've I've caught the the Chelmsford sides a couple of times, the Cobras and the Pythons, and the, and I've seen the Rattlesnakes once, the under sixteens. Yeah, and I mean, it, there's so much talent there. There's so much talent. I mean, the, the final against Sully Hall uh, and the Queen Bees was was a phenomenal end to end game. Loads of pace, loads of skill. I know it's not contact, but there was definitely physicality in there. Those women go out there and mm. battle uh, every single shift. 
and we should be showing we should be shining an equal light and all the disciplines that we've got. And I think the the women's game doesn't get that enough. It really doesn't. Um, and I think it's a travesty because why why should it just be the men that get the publicity out there? Because if anybody that listens to this, if, if you've not had a chance to go along and watch any of the women's games, especially the elite ones, go along and support every team, obviously. But I was genuinely surprised at some of the level of the, the elite league players and the way that they played and the skill that they've got and the, the different way that they play the game because there's not that massive physical aspect to it, like all the hitting and the fighting and all that, the more technical. Um, and there's some really, really talented players on there. And it's something that, again, the IHA should be shining a light on. And it, it, that's another failing on their part. I know they've, they've got a lot of things being the governing body that they need to look over. But for me right now, when you look at, like you say, the social media posts, it's very much National League-centric. And basically, yeah. if you want if you want to call them the franchise stars like uh, Kieran Brown or your Rory Herman or anybody that's lit it up the year before, the, the week before, or Ross Venus or whoever, um. That that's who they centre around, and there's so much more to British hockey that people want to be seeing, and the sort of content that people will eat up because it's not just all National League fans that people are interested in. They want to see some light being shine, shone, sorry, on on other areas of the hockey. Mm. And a lot of the females teams, they're really good with their social media, especially things like TikTok, you know, creative videos, and having a bit of showing what it is to them having a lot of fun. Yeah, really good. And I don't know if you caught any of the stuff from the uh, the Elite League final. Some of the, the posts that went up and the videos of the stuff that they put on was like, really interactive, it was funny, it was engaging. But that that's their showcase event. That's when they think that they can put it out and people eat it up. It's like mm. it, they need to be finding a way to shine a light on these teams' social media channels and what they're doing. And if they do something, if the EIHA follow all the clubs and they see the stuff that they're putting out, how hard is it to retweet on it? It's not, is it? Yeah. No, no, and it's and it's not like I mean I'm assuming I haven't looked on their social media front page. They've probably got something that says along the lines of retweet or like is not a um, you know you know it doesn't mean that we agree or we're backing you. Yeah, it's not an endorsement, but they 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 should be sharing everything, absolutely everything from as you say from all of the things even down to the para hockey because haven't yeah having watched that that's astonishing, absolutely astonishing just the physical capabilities that they've got more than any of us. I mean, you could put an elite league player on there against a para player on the sides because that's, that's what we try to do with the RAF team. We were sort of talking to one of the Steel Kings guys and what we were going to do, like, for a sort of help for heroes thing was we were going to get on the sleds and, and play against the Steel Kings and see how it was. And hopefully that is something that comes about, maybe gain a bit more traction for them as well. Um, mm. But even I've watched them train numerous occasions. I've took the kids down to sort of, expose them to it and, and show them that it's not just a hockey when we go along and watch the Steel Dogs or we watch the Steelers or we watch whoever. You know, there's so much hockey out there and, and every single discipline deserves that equal limelight and for people to get on board and get behind them because as hockey players, there's nothing better than people coming along and watching you. I mean, it's it's not it's not because of your ego. It's just it feeds into the game. It feeds into the atmosphere and, and you perform better because you go out and go hell for leather because there's people cheering for you and everybody deserves that, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially with as I've discussed with everybody that's come on here and I, I, when I talk to people at the rink, the time and commitment and finance and everything that goes into playing that game, then at the very minimum, they, they deserve people to be coming along, shouting their name, screaming when you score a goal. Because, yeah, it's, and, and, it, and that's what it needs. I mean, do, do you think it's going to take the the national sides, men, women, possibly even the para, making a, a Winter Olympics to try and it's get a little take, bit more traction. It's going to take something, isn't it? And I mean, I've um, I've been silent on the whole Adam Johnson thing and I don't really want to go into it, but I think the, the sad thing about it is that the only time that we've gained major exposure uh, along all the media outlets in our country and beyond for UK hockey at any level it is off of the back of one of the most horrific tragedies that the world of hockey's ever seen. Um, yeah. I think the old deal that we used to have with Sky, I, I remember they used to watch the Friday night highlights package where I think it was Laura Woolhouse and Simsy and that. I think they did it on a Friday night. I used to watch that even then. I never really had an interest in elite league hockey, but um, it was hockey, wasn't it? It was British and that's what I wanted to watch. And there were some lads that mm. I played juniors with that were still playing then. 
Um, and we had that exposure there. I, I just don't think there's anything out there. And I, I think it's going to need to be some monumental effort from one of the sides at a high profile tournament, like you say, like an Olympic game, Winter Olympics or, or a World Championship. In fact, no, it's not even going to take a World Championship because our boys have been at the top level for a couple of years now and they've, granted, they've not been pulling up trees, but they managed to stay there and then they've got back there. And, and where have you yeah. seen that on BBC? Where have you seen that on Sky News? If not, what, what is it going to take for people to get on board and fight a coma? Yeah, I mean, I was sitting watching uh, Sky Sports News the other morning and the the only reason anything hockey was in there was a, about Adam Johnson. And then they chuck the NHL results in at the end. But it's like, if you're chucking the NHL results in at the end, at least chuck the Elite League results in as well. Or, or just, just talk about it. A fair... 30 second rundown of the results about what's happening with British teams. And yeah. I mean, it's the it's the highest attended indoor sport in the UK, and that's been the case for year yeah. upon year upon year. And there's still people you'd meet in the street and they say, Oh, what do you do? What do you watch? Who, what are you interested in? You say ice hockey, and they're like, ice hockey? Is ice hockey in Britain? Well, you've got a rink mm. like five minutes down the road there. Oh, I thought that was just public skating sessions and figure skating. No, there's an NHL two team there. There's an NHL one team there. There's a national team there. There's juniors. There's loads of GB players come out of there, but no, nobody's none the wiser because as much as we bang the drum and try to put stuff out on social media, the only people that consume that for the most part is people within the hockey community. Yeah, so, so for it's that just recirculating to, rather than branching. And for that to get out to the masses, like you say, it needs to be some sort of major media outlet to, to highlight what we are doing and the good things that we're doing and not the one horrible thing that touch wood will, will never ever happen again because there's people that I know now and you've probably had the same probably everybody in the UK somebody that knows that you're into hockey but they've never once bothered to talk to you about it but they've come up to you now and they want to know all your take and again it's like even at that point I've sort of refused to comment in the sense that it's not something I, I genuinely want to talk about. Um, and it's not something that I think should be used to, to garner attention or, or, or something that people should just genuinely start being interested in ice hockey based off of the back of um, Adam's un untimely death. But it, it's a horrible situation, but it, there's no way that that should be the one thing that we get publicity for because as much as we lambast uh, governing bodies, as much as we lambast operating facilities there's so much good going on in UK hockey and I don't think we highlight enough the good stuff we're so quick to highlight the bad stuff and that's me included yeah yeah and obviously I mean that's why I've tried to sort of balance this out by because you know we've dug out the EIHA we've dug out the DOPS we've dug out Planet I so I, you know I want to talk the positives as well and I think one of the big positives and something that is helping to grow it is the amount of clubs now that are live streaming their games. And I don't think it's ever going to affect the gate because the rinks are the size that they are. You, you know, you're never going to get more people in them. But I think the streams are for your away fans or your people that can't make the journey at a certain time of night. And admittedly, I'm a bit green to it. I don't know what you really need, how much it costs, how you actually get it out live as pay-per-view. But there's a bit of me that says it can't be that hard. Look at all the stuff we can do, just us sitting here talking to each other through computers. It can't be that hard. No, and I wouldn't say so. And I think that is a fantastic thing. And that's something I've always been mindful for um, doing commentary. I've listened to a few comms, like streams, you know, when I'm, I've not done it myself. And like you say, it is, for the most part, it's for the away fan. And that's why even though Sheffield is my local team, I'm in no way a homer. I know a lot of the lads and I've got a lot of time for Sheffield and they want them to do well but if there's something that Sheffield player did wrong you, you call it out as much as you would do the opposition mm. um, it's mostly away fans that listen to it I'm not pandering to them I'm just calling it as I see it um, and I think the more that you get streams that are mostly neutral and can look at both sides of the coin and call it as you see it I think you'll see that grow but I think it's a potential income stream and for a growth of a club especially one like the Steel Dogs that in previous years gone by, I've really struggled to get people through the door because of what they've got across the road with the Steelers. Obviously, now they're all under the one umbrella. I'm hoping that changes, and we've seen a bit of a footfall now where the Steelers fans coming through the door with reduced ticket prices. Um, but I think all clubs, if, if they can financially viably do it, 
to try and maximise the income stream by doing a stream because if you've got people that are willing to be volunteers and do it and make it happen, I think it just grows, again, the exposure your club's got to everybody, chucking out clips of things that have happened from previous games and getting them shared around. It shows what your team's all about and how professionally, whatever level it is, you take the sport. Yeah. With the, the Steelers and the Steel Dogs, and especially as that's something your geographical arena, do, what do you think about that that link up? Is it creating the pathway that needs to be created? So I've um, obviously when it, was, it came on that I was going to be part of the Steelers uh, commentary team. There was a lot of Steelers fans sort of jumped to my back because of stuff that I've said previously, and it, I don't give a shit about it. I don't give a shit about the opinions of people like that that I've got about me. The stuff I've said about the Steelers in the past, and it was just the Steel Dogs were their own entity and their own organisation. And I'll stand by that at that time. I mean, uh, Simsy and Tony Smith and everybody that's involved with the Steelers organisation have, have obviously seen those tweets. I've not took them down. They've been republicised because people have screenshotted my tweets and tried to share them and cancel culture and get me kicked out before it even started. Um, but the, the way that they've sort of gone about it now in the sort of youth that they're starting to bring in, and I know Tony's vision going forward, what he wants to do year on year, I think it does create that pathway from the Steel Dogs up to the Steelers. And like for me, I'm not going to turn around and say that's not going to happen and I'm, I'll kibosh it and I'm not interested in it. I genuinely think that there's an interest in it. And I think if we are going to have a way where the Steel Dogs are going to feed players up to the Elite League or, or any team for that matter, I think there needs to be more affiliates between the National League and the Elite League, even down to NIHL 1, NIHL 2, and create that clear pathway all the way up. And Steelers are the first team to do it with the Steel Dogs. Has there been teething problems? Yeah, there has. But I think in the long term it can only be seen as a as a, a positive thing moving forwards. And I'm behind yeah, it. Yeah, I think it's the yeah, I think it's the best way to get the the young British players playing at the highest level that they can they can play at. And you know if they if they can't hack the elite league, at least give them a chance to prove that they can or they can't. Because otherwise good- if you just got these 20 player rosters with 18 imports, which is probably going to be the case in the next couple of years. What's, what's going to happen to the national team? Yeah, and the good thing is about the Steelers, they're in a very unique position in the fact that they've got the Steelers, the Steel Dogs are 400 metres apart. So if there's lads that are the intrinsic members of the Steel Dog squad and the Steelers train every single day, sometimes at a Sheffield they train, then if they want somebody to train up, they can jump on there, they can go over to the arena and train with them. They've, they've got the perfect sort of um, blueprint to make it happen. It's maybe not as easy for a team like Manchester because they've got maybe Ultra and Macy's playing NHL 1 and NHL 2 or whatever. But from the national to the elite league is the closest step that you've got to. Yes, the step's massive. But being in that close proximity and having a team that play out of the league that's the closest to the elite league there, it's a prime example to make it happen. And I hope that it does work and I hope that more elite league teams look at potential teams to create that pathway all the way up because that's all we ever want and that's all I've ever gone on about is seeing Brits play at the highest level possible in the home country mm. because we're seeing so many of them forced into Europe to, to play the higher level um, even some lads from the NRHL1 have, have gone over to Europe in the last year to, to play over there and obviously we all know Liam Kirk is out in um, Finland isn't he, at the moment I think Czechia Czechia yeah I, I get so confused with a lot, a lot of the European countries out there. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was in Finland last year, wasn't he? He was in Finland, wasn't he? Yeah. So it's yeah, and it's a shame to see that. I mean, it's great for their development, I think, to play in as many countries as they possibly can because the game's going to be different everywhere. Yeah, and to me, that I think but that's yeah, still them... up. Sorry, Ben. No, no, no. To see them in their own country, as you said, their own country at the highest level, surely that's got to be the end goal. Yeah, and uh, but I think there's a lot to be said for going to Europe, and I think that's still something that they need to address. I think the import levels are still too high. I think for a lot of the elite league fans that they look at and say, "Oh, well, the national league need to be doing more, and the IH need to be doing more." Yes, they do, but so do the elite league. Uh, and I think there is genuine talent there. There's lads that are capable of stepping up, but I think the problem the elite league's got at the moment is that if you want somebody to come on full time in the elite league and be a Brit and make that their job because the amount of time that they train, the um they don't have any time to do anything else and they need to commit to the sport. It needs to be a sustainable wage. It needs to be a wage where they can 
live their life and just focus on playing hockey. And I think if we look at that sort of structure, I don't know how you restructure it and the fact that Brits do get paid what they're worth and that they're played in the roles that suit them. I mean, Kieran Brown's a prime example. So many people talk about him. And I, I'll wax lyrical about him because I think he's so talented defensively and as a hockey player. And he, he's found a home at Leeds and I think it's brilliant that he is, but there's no doubt that he could do a job in the Elite League. But if you're going to take Kieran Brown up and stick him in the fourth line and tell him to go out and bang bodies, you're buzzing glue. That's not what the kids are there mm. for. You stick him in a line with two imports that he's going to be able to feed, that are going to be able to feed him. He'll score goals in that league. I can guarantee it, 100%, no doubt. Yeah, no, and that, like I say, I think we, we've seen it. Oli Endicott stepped up to the blaze a couple of times, I think. And um, I know last season, Archie Salisbury stepped up from NHL 1 because he was with Chelmsford uh, and the Peterborough Phantoms. And he played with the Nottingham Panthers for a couple of weeks. Um, I think he's actually at Milton Keynes Lightning now. But yeah, I think the talent's here. The the GB under 18s had a had a good tournament. I think it was late last year. Both both the men and the women under 18s are, are looking quite good. And as you said, the senior men are up at the top table. The senior women are certainly holding their own where they are. So it's all looking in the right direction. I just think we need a little bit of help from from above. Yeah, and I, I think I mean I've I've harped on about it for long long enough and maybe more recently but the only way that I think that we're going to have a way that we can drive forward in one united um, direction and with clear direction and where we need to go as a whole sporting entity is if we fall under one umbrella I think that that's something that needs to happen sooner rather than later because all this infighting and egos between disciplines in EIHA and SIHA and Ice Hockey UK does does nothing for us. It doesn't make us look professional either. It needs somebody sat no. at the top of the tree directing the sport in the direction that we, as the members, want it to go in through a leader that can see that direction and push it forward. Yeah, excellent. Mate, I, I see no better place to leave it than right there. That's a, a positive note to end on. And, uh, mate, keep what you're doing. On Twitter, because we do we do love it when when the uh, the controversial stuff starts, everyone starts searching for Jamie Mack on Twitter to see what's going on. I uh, I don't think everybody thinks that, mate. I think there's probably fifty percent <laughs> of my followers are waiting for me to do something stupid so they can uh, engage cancel culture. But like I said to you before, that anything that I say on there, mate, it comes from a good place for the most part, uh, and it's it's not ill founded. Uh, views or, or anything that I just want to ramble and gain views and traction it's because it's coming from a place, a good place and, and something that I think that may well be able to initiate change along down the road Yeah, excellent mate, thank you so much for your time really do appreciate it oh, Thank you Ben and honestly please keep doing what you're doing I think from where you started and what it's become, I think it's fantastic I listen to a lot of your podcasts as well and I definitely will go forward and that goes for everybody across everybody so they are doing podcasts it's a thankless task there's no money in it nobody's doing this to get rich they're doing it because it's a, a labour of love and something that they want to highlight a good shine a light on the sport and I think you do a great job at that mate thank you mate I really do appreciate it no worries. Right, Jamie McElroy thank you very much today A massive thank you to the Mac man, Jamie McElroy, for joining me on this episode. Hopefully we discussed everything there that, that people thought we were going to. I don't think we really left many stones unturned. Um, and Jamie will, will come back, undoubtedly, towards the end of the year, as we'll talk about the NIHL 1 in a little bit more detail, go into the specific teams, specific players that could perhaps excel at this level or even move up. So, yeah, massive thanks to Jamie for joining me. And if there's anything in there that you agreed with, didn't just didn't didn't agree with, you know that's what it's all about. It's all about opinions. So by all means, please jump on all of the socials. We're on Instagram, Facebook, tw uh, Twitter slash X, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube. Get on there. Let us know what you thought, whether you agreed or disagreed, because it's all about opinions, and it's nice to get everybody's in there. So yeah, make sure you're following in all those social channels so that you don't miss anything. Again, go back and listen to that concussion special because it's an absolutely cracking episode. And uh, if you're still playing hockey or any other contact sport now, make sure you reach out to Jacko because he might be able to help prolong your career and, and even make it better for you right now. Thank you once again for listening. 
Next week, we'll be back with the all the Britain action from this weekend's coming fixtures, the exclusive coaches' thoughts, the match reports, the player of the week, and I will be joined by the Chelmsford Chieftains captain, Alan Lack. So please look forward to that one. That will be a good one. Uh, and then moving towards through the end of the year, we'll be joined by the Solent Devils big man, Joe Llewellyn. He'll be coming on board to tell us everything about his hockey career and what's going on down in Solent at the moment. Uh, I will also be joined by Stretton player Ziggy Beasley. He'll be coming on towards the end of December, before Christmas, so we'll get a Christmas sort of special episode out that we'll have a few bits in. Uh, Courtney Grant at some point as well before Christmas, that will be out. Uh, a nice little chat with me and Courtney. And there will also be uh, the Cambridge Kodiaks will have some representation. I believe I'll be talking to their captain and their head coach. Uh, that will probably be on the Christmas special episode as well. So we're going to be hitting up a bit of WNIHL again and getting the info on the women's hockey. Once again, thank you for listening. I will see you next time.